same time that we're meeting. It's going to have to catch it as a, a, a posted after the fact YouTube uh, meeting. So uh, with that, uh, it's today is Thursday, uh, May 28th, uh, just after 10 o'clock. This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. And uh, we're digging in this week on Global Warming Solutions Act and uh, appreciate that we have, we're getting some excellent help from a number of people uh, with thinking our way through the, the issues that we've been uncovering. Just for our guests today, we have had a detailed walkthrough and discussion with legislative council on the bill, uh, delegation, rulemaking, cause of action. Um, and then yesterday we spent an hour plus with ANR hearing sort of a counter proposal and they raised some issues. And now we're turning to um, the treasure trove of uh, informed people that are in the state to help us uh, learn some more. So with that, uh, Ms. Duggan, good morning. Good to see you again. Good morning. And we're aiming for roughly 20 minutes of witness, knowing that we might go over a little bit with questions, but it should work out just about right. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify this morning. For the record, my name is Jen Duggan, and I'm the Director of Conservation Law Foundation, Vermont. Prior to joining CLF, I was the general counsel of the Agency of Natural Resources for three years. CLF strongly supports this bill, which we believe provides a critical foundation and framework for both cutting climate pollution and building community resilience. I want to thank you for all of your work to rapidly respond to the needs of Vermonters during the COVID crisis. I have been incredibly impressed with how quickly the Senate has transitioned to virtual operations. And I know from speaking with my colleagues in other uh, New England states that the transition has not been as smooth everywhere. And I also want to thank you for continuing to make action on the climate crisis a priority this year by passing S337 and S185 and taking up the Solutions Act. You know, for me, I think, and for many people, this pandemic has demonstrated that we are both intimately connected with the global community and heavily dependent on our local communities at the same time. And the same really holds true for the climate emergency. And even in the midst of the pandemic, Vermonters believe climate action must be a priority. And, and just this morning, I shared a letter from over 40 businesses and organizations and more than 600 individuals thanking you um, and members of the committee for your work on the COVID-19 crisis um, in, in S337 and 185 and urging the Senate to pass the Solutions Act. As we rebuild from this pandemic, climate action can help accelerate our recovery and provide a pathway to a stronger Vermont. I want to start off by putting the Solutions Act into context and two points in particular that are important. First, there is an urgent need to act on climate. Um, I think we all agree and Senator McDonald, as you noted yesterday, we should have done this 20 years ago. Um, working groups and commissions have studied this issue for decades while failing to lead, and we're not on track to achieve net zero by 2050. We have no binding plan to get from here to there. We have an obligation both to do our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and take action to support our vulnerable communities who are already feeling the impacts of climate change. And the pandemic has really exposed the extreme inequities and safeguards for our communities. Yeah. And at the same time, it's created an opportunity for us to be intentional and course correct. We can transition to a carbon-free economy and make long-term investments in climate resilient communities that address these systemic inequities. We can't continue to let vulnerable communities fall even further behind. Second, action on climate and investments in community resilience bring significant economic, public health, and environmental benefits. 
We can grow the economy, we can create jobs, save healthcare dollars, improve public health, and improve the quality of our natural and working lands through strategic climate action. The economic opportunities and public health benefits that addressing climate and resilience bring to the table is even more important as we work to rebuild our economy after the pandemic. You know, as you noted yesterday, Senator Bray, we can rebuild to a more equitable and durable economy than the one we had going into the pandemic. With that context in mind, I want to talk about why the Solutions Act framework works. There's a reason that Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and Maine already have similar laws on the books. Massachusetts, for example, is on track to achieve reduction requirements and all of the economic opportunities and co-benefits that come with climate action. And I think the committee is going to hear more about Massachusetts experience um, in greater detail from, from David Cash later this morning. Vermont is not blazing a new trail. In fact, we are lagging behind. And that really shouldn't be acceptable to anyone, especially when we have the highest per capita emissions of any New England state, um, New York and, and Quebec. So the Solutions Act framework works, um, and here's why. First, it requires an all hands on deck approach to an all hands on deck emergency. You know, I have found it somewhat ironic that a lot of the conversation up to this point has seemed to be about who should be taking the lead um, on tackling the climate crisis. Is it the General Assembly or the executive branch? And really, you know, the fact of the matter is that we need everyone. We need legislators, we need the executive branch, we need private companies, individuals, all pulling in the same direction. If we're going to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. And that really is what H688 requires. Second, the Solutions Act requires state action and leadership from both the General Assembly and the executive branch. We can't meet this challenge any other way. Private sector leadership, market-based solutions and individual action are all important. But in order to maximize and direct these efforts, we need binding reduction requirements and the right regulatory framework in place. Third, it requires strategic coordination across state government. The mitigation and adaptation work we have to do as a state, it crosses agencies and sectors, and it's gonna require a diverse mix of strategies. One of the things that I have found most troubling these past few months is that the state does not even have a comprehensive inventory of the climate and resilient actions we're taking, what we're actually accomplishing with this work, and whether or not it's cost effective. There's also currently no framework in place for ensuring that the climate action that we are taking is equitable and it doesn't leave our rural and other vulnerable communities behind. The Solutions Act creates a formal framework for strategic and coordinated state action and investment. And it requires that strategies that the state moves forward with, they're equitable and they meet the needs of our rural communities. And this is even more important now as the state grapples with the inequities and economic impacts from the pandemic. Finally, the Solutions Act works because it creates an accountability framework to achieve net zero by 2050. The health of our communities on the front lines of climate change and the health of our children and future generations is at stake. It's that simple. And goals are just not going to cut it. Our failure to act over the last several decades shows that we need binding requirements and hard deadlines in place to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. And we have to be able to hold the state accountable if climate pollution requirements are just ignored. The cause of action provisions that are included in the Solutions Act are really a necessary backstop in light of what is at stake and a repeated failure to take action. The attorney general who would be defending these lawsuits has voiced his full support 
for the bill and the need for individuals to be able to hold their government accountable in the courts. It's also important to note that these provisions are narrowly tailored to get the job done and no more. So the remedy is limited to a remand back to ANR to do a rulemaking. In other words, ANR is required to just comply with the law. The state's not on the hook for financial penalties and the plaintiffs don't receive any monetary damages. And I wanna briefly address the recovery of fees and costs for individuals since ANR has proposed to eliminate these provisions. And there's a really important policy rationale here. You know, these types of provisions attempt to address the imbalance of power between individuals and the government and ensure that everybody has access to the courts. There's no accountability if an individual that's been harmed doesn't have the resources to get into court. And the provisions in the Solutions Act strike that balance between the need. Jen, we can't hear you. Oh, it says I was muted by the host. Oh. <laughs> How diabolical. <laughs> so I will, what was the last thing that you heard, Senator Bray? So I don't, I'm not you sure where I was. We uh, heard you say, uh, good morning, uh, my name is Jen Duggan. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, you were talking about the fees and costs, that if, if there's a harm to an individual, okay. uh, how can they get a remedy? Okay, great. So the provisions in the Solutions Act, they strike that balance between the need for government accountability and protection of the state from lawsuits that are just brought in bad faith. And there is precedent for these types of provisions in Vermont. You know, the Vermont Public Records Act, for example, has a very similar provision. And it allows successful plaintiffs to recover their fees and costs if a court determines that an agency has unlawfully withheld records. You know, the same goes for the, the state agency if a plaintiff brings a lawsuit in bad faith, you know, that's frivolous, that doesn't have any merit. And, these provisions are also common in many federal statutes. So bef I, wanna, I wanna take a, a few moments also to speak to some of the committee questions that have surfaced these past few days about the role of the General Assembly in the Solutions Act. And I know that you've already heard this from Mr. Martlin, but I just wanna emphasize again, you know, that the delegation to the executive branch in the bill is constitutional and the bill preserves the General Assembly's traditional role as law and policymaker. So keep in mind that this plan is going to be a mix of mitigation and adapt, you know, adaptation strategies. And it's going to include both legislative and rulemaking recommendations. You know, we need to do all of the things um, in order to get there. So it's going to have a mix. And you know, if the recommendations um, involve an expansion of authority, if they involve new taxes, fees, or appropriations, that is the sole authority, you know, um, of the General Assembly. And the General Assembly would continue to exercise their traditional oversight over rules that, that ANR might promulgate as a result of the plan. And the General Assembly, you know, would be notified early of the rule recommendations in the plan itself. And again, when the rules themselves are drafted, they may question climate council members or agencies about the rules and uh, can object to rules that are not consistent with an agency's authority. And at the end of the day, the General Assembly has the last word, you know, the, you all can always pass a law to invalidate, clarify, or amend a rule. And I've been following, you know, some of the conversation about the potential for legislative approval or a check-in before the planned recommendations are implemented. But my read of the bill is that this oversight is already built into H688. And, you know, I agree with Mr. Martland that requiring approval of the, the plan or the rules in that plan is problematic for a couple of different reasons. And one, you know, from a procedural perspective, 
there couldn't be a simple up or down vote of the plan. It would have to follow the same process as any bill. And you know, keep in mind that any recommendations that are in the plan that involve new authority taxes, fees, or appropriations would follow this process anyway. So you're already on that track. Um, you know, for the same reasons, requiring pre you know approval of the plan, it would significantly delay rulemaking, and ANR would not be able to meet the deadlines in the bill. And time really is of the essence here. Um, I also agree with Mr. Martland that requiring um, approval of the regulatory measures in the plan could raise separation of powers um, concerns. And you know, finally, and I think this is you know maybe most important, the framework and the Solutions Act, it's the floor. Um, there's nothing in this bill that would prohibit um, the General Assembly from passing laws to address the climate crisis, to do things faster, to do things sooner. That is still certainly able to be done. The Solutions Act is just the floor and the framework to make sure that we get to net zero by 2050. One other... Uh, Senator Campion? Jen, Jen, would you prefer I wait until the end? No, I'm happy to take questions now or at the end, whatever is easier. I just, so one of the things we've been we've been grappling with, and you've talked a little bit about it, and you might want to wait until the end, to, is, you know, should there be a way, sort of, like I keep, to be honest, keep going back and forth around getting the legislature to come back and have some kind of approval with the plan put forward. And just kind of keep that in, in, in the back of your mind as you're, you're continuing to talk. That's, you know, yesterday I felt better about, uh, about the whole thing when we were, um, you know, when we were talking about, yes, the people, the administration, others, the people will be held accountable. But I still wonder if there's a, if in terms of our responsibility as a legislature to our constituents, if there's some reason for us to, to have some kind of, kind of check-in. That's, you know, I totally understand that concern. Um, you know, I think that it depends on what kind of check-in that you're really looking for. I think that there are built-in check-ins in terms of providing you with a plan, the ability to have oversight into what the council is doing as often as you like, all of the traditional oversight that comes with rulemaking, and then anything that is going to be um, new authority taxes or fees, that's going to come to you all as a body. So that is the ultimate check-in. Nothing is going to move forward. Right. I'm wondering um, though, if, if the plan itself, if it just seems to me that if the plan itself has something in there that we believe, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, isn't effective, isn't as good a policy based on what is happening in the state at the time, what we're hearing from constituents, an another way to get at something. Is there not a reason for us to review and approve the plan? Well, I, th I, I think that you can effectively um, have that kind of oversight and authority. Um, because you, nothing is going to move forward that's new authority, taxes, fees. Um, and then there's always the ability of the General Assembly to, um, to, to weigh in early on rulemaking, but always to pass a law that would effectively invalidate or amend that rule. There's something that you don't like in that rule. At the end of the day, you will have the ability to pass a law to, to modify that. And the concern with having um, approval, having the General Assembly approve the plan before uh, the, you know, the, the rulemaking moves forward is, you know, from a procedural perspective, that there's really not a simple way to do that in the General Assembly. And I think, you know, Mr. Martland spoke to this a little bit um, but 
it's not, there couldn't be an up or down vote. So you would, you would have the plan that would go through the same process as a bill. There would be um, opportunity to do amendments. You know, it's not guaranteed that it would be approved or didn't, you know, pass at the end of the, right. at the end of the session. And the time that that would take would really um, impact ANR's ability to meet the deadlines and the rules. Um, so from a, it's a procedural and a timing perspective that makes that problematic. And at the end of the day, um, nothing is gonna move forward unless the General Assembly blesses it anyway, if it is involving new authority taxes, fees, or appropriations. And then there's always the ability, um, if things go really haywire, um, you know, in terms of a rulemaking, if, if there's not the ability to influence it early to actually pass a law to invalidate it. Good points. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Senator Gray, did you have a question? Yes, thanks. Um, the thing I wanted to check in about a little bit, so right now, say the bill passes, those uh, aspirational goals become hard target, hard goals in, in statute. Um, ANR already has ample rulemaking authority, right? I mean, it would seem as though even prior to having a plan, uh, they've been in a position already three plus years to have started making rules that would achieve some of these same goals. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to sort out to what degree are they really waiting for a plan to arrive versus they already have the authority if they had the interest in moving something. Um, I appreciate that the taxes and fees part comes back to us, but um, you know, it seems as though they have a lot of authority already. Uh, we're questioning whether or not they might need additional authority and we could grant that, but I would like to think they, um, they could already do a lot of this work. Uh, I'm not saying absent the bill, like we don't want to move the bill, but absent the bill, they could still do a lot of this work. Is that not correct? Well, I think that's why this bill is necessary. Um, you know, the, the, ANR and other agencies have, you know, fairly significant authority right now to address emissions and other and resilience. Um, and that's not happening. Um, you know, I think that there, it's, there are a lot of reasons for why um, the agency may not be exercising the authority that it already has. But the bill puts in place those deadlines to make sure that we are moving forward. Um, you know, everyone will still have to work together um, in order to make this framework work. Um, but there is um, an accountability framework that's built in that will, you know, require that ANR exercise some of that authority. Um, there may be good reason, you know, the council may decide, you know, ANR could potentially promulgate a rule to do X and reduce carbon emissions, but we actually think that it would be better, um, you know, because of equity or cost effective reasons for a new program to be stood up, you know, by the legislature and new authority. So there may be valid reasons why um, the council may recommend new legislation versus just having ANR move forward with a particular rulemaking. This Jen, I need to just interrupt you for a moment because Jude needs to interrupt the committee for a moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I need to identify the caller with the last number 197. Good morning, this is Ashlyn Doyon from the treasurer's office. Great, thank you. And the person with 191. Person with this is Ashlyn again. I believe that's the treasurer. Okay, thank you. All right, we're good. So we're getting zoom bombed by the treasurer. That's a yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I so I think that you know there you might be able to take a sledgehammer um, to get you know carbon reductions, but by requiring this really diverse, thoughtful council 
um, to go through this process and require them to think about strategies that have co-benefits that are equitable. Um, you know, I think that we're really able to um, maximize both carbon reductions and, you know, building a stronger economy and creating that community resilience. So there, there's an importance there in having a, a diverse set of folks think about, okay, how can we cut climate? How can we build community resilience in a way that doesn't leave communities behind and that's equitable and gets us the most, um, is most cost effective. So thank you very much. I am guessing we could come up with more questions unless someone has sort of a burning last question. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and we um, we'll need to <coughs> on to Mr. Duval. I, okay. Senator Bray, I had a few yes. more thoughts. Um, is it okay if I take just five more minutes and I'll try and wrap up really quickly? Uh, can we go a little faster than that? But um, Sure. Yep. I just want to make a, I will go, I will take three minutes. Um, and I really appreciate um, the time. Um, I just want to talk briefly about ANR's proposed um, amendments. You know, they are just not workable. They undermine key components of the bill for a lot of different reasons. One, it cuts out meaningful participation by this diverse set of legislatively appointed stakeholders and technical experts by giving the executive branch complete control of the Climate Council and the plan's recommendations. Um, the council is not required to stand up critical subcommittees to ensure these recommended actions are equitable, meet the needs of our rural communities, and invest in our agriculture and forestry sectors. If those topics are important, and I think everyone understands that they are, then they should be required by the bill. Um, and the accountability provisions are gutted. You know, there's no cause of action for failure to meet emission reduction requirements until 2050. And their proposal would eliminate the fee provisions that ensure Vermonters have equal access to the courts. So I would just strongly urge the committee to reject these amendments and to please, you know, support the bill. Okay, so a very quick question, uh, very quick question and response. We, we have a model that's floating out there that came up again yesterday was we have a clean water board it's led by the administration and then has an advisory panel. We did the Act 250 commission. There was a uh, commission and then there was an advisory board. So um, what is it about having and um, you know, if we're going to hold an administration accountable, then one, it seems like a reasonable thing for them to say is, um, well, then let us be in charge of the activities so that if there's a failure, we actually own it as opposed to we were just merely present but outvoted by a council that we somehow didn't agree with, you know? So uh, how do you, so what's your thinking on that? Well, I think that your comment um, earlier, Senator Bray, around why there has not been an exercise of authority that the agency already has is really on point here. Um, this is really about everybody working together to pull in the same direction. Um, and so it's not just about the executive branch. We need that um, diverse set of folks that you all would appoint to hold the executive branch accountable in coming up with the best solutions for climate action. And so, you know, in our, from my perspective, it's really critical that the executive branch does not have complete control you know over the climate council and the plan recommendations they have significant you know there's a, a huge number of um, agencies that participate in that council and they will have um, a lot of control but i think it's important that the folks that you all would appoint also have the ability to vote and shape um, the recommendations okay well great well uh, we're not voting the bill out today, so we'll have a chance to talk with you again as a committee. Um, and so thanks again for participating. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the extra few minutes. Yep. Thanks so much. There's never enough time, I realize that. So good morning, Mr. Duval. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm hoping you can uh, share some thinking with the committee. You know, I think particularly one of the things you helped us with last January, which feels like three years ago, um, was looking at the, the basic shape of emissions curves and 
what our trajectory is and, and how this bill could be used to uh, reshape that trajectory. I don't know that everyone's memorized, for instance, the Paris Agreement targets, et cetera. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Bray and senators of the committee for the chance to talk with you this morning. Um, again, my name is- screen share ability. Thank you, thank you, Jude. Um, for the record, my name is Jared Duvall, Executive Director of the Energy Action Network. And um, I am going to go ahead and um, start sharing my screen. Um, just one moment. So just a quick reminder for folks who may not uh, remember, um, Energy Action Network consists of over 200 member businesses, organizations from across Vermont, um, and is supported by a small backbone staff that commits to, ser to, be, to serve as a trusted and neutral convener of that network. We commit not to taking positions on pieces of legislation uh, b before uh, the General Assembly. So I, I will not today be uh, lobbying on behalf of or in opposition to uh, the bill bef before you. Our role is really to make sure that the state's energy and climate conversation is grounded in the best available uh, data and analysis to, have, to help inform an evidence-based policy conversation. The main way that we do that every year is through an annual progress report for Vermont, where we compile federal data, uh, work with state agency partners to give us a lay of the land of a tracking of our progress towards the state's energy and climate goals. Um, and so I have three main messages that I wanna share with you that I think are highlights from this year's report that bear on um, the Global Warming Solutions Act that you're now considering. Number one is that meeting the targets in this bill um, is possible. We have the technology and the know-how to do it. Um, and in some ways, it's not that much of a lift at all. Um, meeting Vermont's commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement would be the equivalent of us getting down to the per capita emissions levels of New Hampshire. Um, and we are seeing a flourishing of the key technologies and best practices that can enable us to get there um, every, every year. The second is that doing so, meeting these targets is a massive opportunity for economic revitalization and resiliency in Vermont. And I'll get more into that. And then the third is that the only states, provinces, or countries that we have identified anywhere in the world that have achieved significant emissions reductions while improving their economy, have either set an economy-wide cap on emissions, as Quebec and California have done, or have passed mandates requiring emissions reduction targets to be achieved, as Massachusetts and New York have done. So let me take each of those um, in turn. Um, so we focus on looking at the peer-reviewed research in terms of the, the, techno the proven and available technology and the best practices for emissions reduction. This is known as our Path to Paris model. It is not a prescription. Um, you could get to the Paris uh, emissions reduction targets, um, which require a 20, at least a 26% reduction below our 2005 emissions levels by 2025. Uh, um, in different ways. You could move one of these bars up or down, but if you did, you'd have to you know, adjust other bars. This works all together. Um, and what, what we're seeing um, is that a number of these technologies costs are declining and there's an opportunity for them to go to scale with the right policy and regulatory framework and, and the right market signals. So one of the things that we added in this year's report was a request to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to do an independent economic impact analysis of what it would mean for Vermont if we hit these targets for the green, the transportation sector, and the orange, the thermal sector, over the next six years. That research was led by uh, economic research analyst Ken Jones, and the broad findings were that if we were to achieve them, we would see, um, we would prevent the loss of a more than a billion dollars leaving the state 
we would achieve net consumer savings of nearly $800 million and we could increase in-state investment uh, by over $300 million. This is sometimes surprising to folks because for a long time, the conversation about the economic impacts of meeting our energy and climate goals has been asking the wrong questions. It has said, what is the cost of the transition? Instead of saying, what is the cost of the status quo? And when you look at the cost of the status quo versus what the energy transformation um, and the improvements in resiliency um, we can achieve over the next six years, um, it's really driven by two things that get you to such impressive numbers like this that come from the agency of commerce. Number one is an understanding of the dollar flows of our energy economy. On average, over the last decade, Vermont has spent uh, about $2 billion a year, uh, Vermonters spend about $2 billion a year on fossil fuels for transportation and heating. That's gasoline and diesel, fuel oil, propane, and natural gas. And when we do that, um, about 75% on average of those dollars flow right out of state. So we have 100% imported fossil fuel. When we spend $2 billion of it, that's a net drain on the economy of a billion and a half dollars leaving the Vermont economy. In contrast, all of the efficient and- um, uh, Jared, may I ask a quick question? Yes. Right. So uh, two, two billion that we're spending in fossil fuels, that's across the best transportation, homes, everything. It, that does not include the electricity sector. That's, that's okay. spending on transportation and heating fuels. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. And in contrast, all of the alternatives that um, we have identified in the path to Paris keep a far larger share of our dollars recirculating locally, contributing to local jobs and improving the Vermont economy. So specifically, 60, it's been estimated by the Agency of Commerce that 60 cents of every dollar that we invest in home weatherization uh, stay and recirculate in state. Think about what those costs are. It's mostly contractor labor. Uh, it varies utility by utility, but on average, 62 cents of every dollar that we spend with our electric utilities stays and recirculates in state. And of course, local wood heating also keeps a far larger share of dollars recirculating in state. We've understood this for a long time when it comes to our food and agricultural economy, but for some reason, we haven't made as much progress in understanding this in our energy economy. But of course, of course, keeping dollars local isn't enough. Um, it's also about the need to save Vermonters money, especially at a time when we're going through um, economic challenges. Um, and that's the, the other side of this coin that is so important. You can, you can cherry pick or take a snapshot of any point in time of a fossil fuel price, but to get a, a clearer picture, it's, it's helpful to take a step back and, and look over time. And if you look at the last 15 years, of comparative ways that you can get around or heat your home, consistently the highest cost and most price volatile options are fossil fuels that cost Vermonters more. So specifically in the upper left there, you see uh, the cost of, of fueling a vehicle with diesel and gasoline, generally higher and much more price volatile than the equivalent cost of charging an electric vehicle. And that doesn't even start to, that doesn't even include the maintenance savings that EVs provide. On the bottom right hand corner, you see a comparison of the cost of different ways to heat homes and buildings. Again, the highest cost and most price volatile over the last 20 years have been propane and fuel oil, um, with the lower cost options being efficient electric heating through cold climate heat pump systems um, and also advanced wood heating systems. So when you combine those two things, shifting our energy spending so that much more money stays local with the ability to revitalize and make the Vermont economy more resilient and getting people off of those roller coaster price curves from fossil fuels onto lower and more stable cost curves for how um, we can heat our homes and get around, you achieve significant consumer savings as well. Um, Another thing that I want to um, point your, I, I know that I have a limited amount of time, so I'm just going to kind of point these out. And if there are follow-up questions, you know, we, we can um, go there. But this uh, is this data directly from the Agency of Natural Resources Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory. 
It shows our historical emissions broken down by sector, the color coding. You see transportation and thermal being the greatest sources, as you well know. Um, and these green dots show the path that we'll need to get on to meet the targets that the state has set and that you're considering uh, in the Global Warming Solutions Act. One of the things that we did for this year's report was to look at all of the greenhouse gas emissions inventories that have Jared, happened. would you go back to that last slide for me? Okay, great. I just want to snap. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. So one of the things that we did for this year's report was to collect all of the state greenhouse gas emissions inventories from across New England um, and New York and Quebec, which we have through data through 2016. And what we found surprised us. It is that Vermont has made the least progress towards our com Paris commitment of any of those states. We have the highest per capita emissions in the, in the region. Um, and we're the only state that has seen an increase in emissions in our emissions baseline since 1990. This often surprises people because we have been, we've, we've heard and it's true that we have uh, managed to successfully reduce emissions from our electricity generation sector. And you see that here since 1990. The challenge is that that decrease has been dwarfed, has been swamped by the increase in emissions from these other sectors, especially transportation. Um, this is another way of looking at our emissions broken down by sector. I'll note that the presence of a policy and regulatory framework has, that, that you have been instrumental in has driven this bar even lower. So these are the numbers from 2016. Agency of Natural Resources and Public Service Department have shared the data in terms of our emissions from electricity generation through 2018. It, is, it has gone from about 800,000 metric tons in 2016 to less than 200,000 metric tons in 2018. As a result of the res, you, you have successfully driven down, the, of the renewable energy standard, you have successfully driven down emissions from electricity generation in Vermont uh, and use um, by about 80%. Um, the challenge is that we do not yet have the policy and regulatory framework and tools to, to tackle the elephants in the room, which are over here. Um, and, you know, when, when we talk about Vermont having the highest per capita emissions, not having reduced since 1990, the chief culprit is the transportation sector. And the main driver of that is that we have higher vehicle miles traveled per capita than any state in the region. Um, this number has increased yet again. Uh, the latest number from the VTrans state energy profile, um, I believe, is um, nearly 11,900 miles uh, now. And we're seeing uh, purchasing decisions of vehicles that, that don't help meet these goals either. The last point I'll make is that, is, is what I started with, is that we have not yet found a state, province, or country that has successfully achieved emissions reduction goals um, while improving their economy unless they've done one of two things. One is set an economy-wide cap on emissions as Quebec and California have done, or uh, require emissions, mandate emissions reductions economy-wide like New York and Massachusetts have done. Vermont has done so with the electricity generation sector, but it's only covering what was 8%, now maybe as low as 2% of our overall emissions from the electricity uh, sector. And I'll say that in closing, we have a phenomenal opportunity to make rapid progress towards these goals because we have something that no other state in the country has which is no matter how you measure it, either the cleanest or among a small handful of the cleanest electricity sectors in the country. Um, and by cleanest, I mean lowest emitting. So every time that we are able to move to um, heat water with a heat pump water heater or do space heating with cold climate heat pumps, or add an electric vehicle instead of a fossil fueled vehicle, we get a greater bang for our buck, a greater emissions reduction from that action than any other place in the country. Because not only are we replacing a dirty, oftentimes less efficient uh, fossil fuel engine or boiler or furnace with a more efficient electric motor, we're also drawing on and benefiting from the lowest emitting electricity in the country. So once we start to see 
the, the market transformation and the uptake of beneficial electrification in the transportation and thermal sectors, we can make really rapid progress because of the progress that we've already made. There is still more that we can achieve, but because of the progress that we've already made, thanks to your leadership, uh, with the electricity sector. And here's just a graph that, that shows what that has looked like post passage of the res, the decline in emissions from our electricity sector. Um, with that, I am going to um, pause and see what questions I may be able to answer. Well, uh, thanks again for um, really very helpful, concise and clear, easy to read, uh, a massive distillation of energy data. So you've been in the committee before and we appreciate you coming back to remind us of where we are and, and what the opportunities look like. And I appreciate too that you've also added in, um, you know, the economic impact uh, study. We, the phrase that we've been using for several years, the clean energy economy has sort of drifted out of focus a little bit in the, in the last several months. So, um, uh, I think it's important that you're reminding us of it, that it's right there. Um, and with that 62, this year's 337, and the third step I hope next year, that beneficial electrification is um, something that I hope that we will really pick up the pace on. Um, so I'm mindful of the clock. We have a speaker who's coming in a, during a tight window. Um, so Unless there's a, a committee question, I would like to just thank Mr. Duval for that very helpful. Thank you, Jared. And we'll go to Mr. Cowers. He's not on the call yet, Senator. Okay, well, that's, uh, we have David Cash from 11 to 11.30, so I think roughly 15, oh. 20 minutes uh, with Mr. Cowers will dovetail just right. But if when he arrives, if you'll, flag me down in case I don't notice I'm showing up on the screen. Thank you again, okay. Mr. Duval. Thank and you. good morning, Mr. Cowart. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me all right? Perfect. All right, um, I'm happy to be here in such good company. It's, it's great to talk about these topics. Uh, for the record, I'm Richard Cowart. With the, I'm a principal with the Regulatory Assistance Project, which is a global nonprofit uh, based in Vermont. We work on energy and climate policy around the world. We've advised governments, states, provinces, nations, uh, really all over. In terms of my background, I'm a lawyer who was for 12 years chair of the Public Utilities Commission in Vermont, so really familiar with a lot of these, these topics. Uh, for the past decade, most of the past decade, I've been uh, directing a program on climate and energy in the European Union. So I've worked with a number of European countries that are leading on a lot of the things we're talking about. And I, for six years, chaired the Electricity Advisory Committee of the U.S. Department of Energy, um, among other uh, tasks that I've taken on over the years. And I have a long association with Efficiency Vermont and um, we'll want to make clear that today I'm not speaking for RAP or for Efficiency Vermont or anybody else. I'm just giving you my own thoughts. I don't have to tell you um, how important the climate agenda is and that the coronavirus crisis doesn't change this. Uh, we still need to flatten the climate curve uh, while we deal with the crisis and as we emerge from the crisis. But I'm going to echo thoughts you've, you've heard from others that a smart recovery plan from the current e economic crisis can help put the economy back on its feet while we make real progress on the longer term climate agenda. And I really would urge you, don't miss this opportunity to emerge from the current economic crisis with good policies that would address our economic, longer term economic and climate needs. As you've heard from others, there are many elements to the solution set and, and your committee has worked on, um, worked on a number of them and heard about many of them. Uh, at the top of my list, uh, you know, we haven't changed at RAC, efficiency first, 
uh, renewable electricity and decarbonizing heat and transportation. And in addition, of course, the transition must be fair and, and special attention must be given to disadvantaged communities, rural households, uh, and, and um, communities in need. In addition, we now know that public policy has to address resilience and adaptation, um, not just carbon reductions. So, you know, this bill addresses all of those points. And I really, I wanna start by commending the drafters and the House for giving you something that has a lot of positive elements uh, in it. But I think it's helpful, I hope it's helpful to the committee if I also address some reservations. Um, as I said, RAP works all over the world and pretty much everywhere we work, we see the growing gap between climate ambition and climate action. And so it's obvious that we need structural mechanisms to create more direct links between ambition and achievement. Um, we've had the debate for decades now about carbon pricing. Economists argue that, well, the way to bridge that gap is just to have a carbon price. And I, you've perhaps heard us in the past, we don't agree. We think prices are good and are direction, can be directionally correct, but they don't provide the silver bullet. We need different kinds of actions in different sectors. And as you just heard from um, Jared, uh, we have to look at these sectors individually and figure out how to address emissions in each of them. So I'm, I'm also now going to echo some things you heard from Ms. Duggan. A clear high level mandate for change with measurable targets is really necessary. We can't just say, oh, we'd like to do, we'd like to reduce emissions. We really need mandates and we need to hold our own feet to the fire as it were. We need an analysis of options and planning based on analysis. And we need- Cash, sorry. Excuse me? I'm sorry, excuse me, David Cash has joined the call. Oh, okay. Hi, David. Good and morning, everybody. Independent public voice that speaks truth to power. And so we really need to, um, we need to look for ways to create that independent voice because we've, we've just seen, we've been talking about this for so long with, without creating a, a voice that is empowered to do that. And it needs to have continuity and persistence. So many of our climate plans have been these short run affairs that just disappear. Now there are models for how you can do this. And um, in deference to Mr. Cash, I'm just gonna skip over that for the moment. But I wanna point out a limitation. Um, models that sorry, create- Mr. Coward, sorry to interrupt. And just uh, um, for air traffic control, so everyone doesn't struggle with what are we doing with the clock? Let's plan to go till about 10 after, and then we'll switch over to Mr. Cash. Mr. Cash, as I understand it, you can only be with us till 11.30. Correct, that right? that's right, that's correct. Okay. It, well, it, if you like, I can just pause here, let him go and come back and continue our discussion after him. Does that work for you? You're all very uh, convivial and flexible. If you would, if you want to do that, Mr. Cash, yeah. wanted, well, I, I think right that's fine. Yeah, he's got a limited window, and I'm at home. <laughs> I mean, I'm at home too, but my yeah. my my window is limited. I do have many uh, other Zoom meetings. Um, please go ahead. So, uh, good morning, Mr. Cash. I was just leading up to what to talking about um, the other jurisdictions that have processes like this. So you're oh, great. exactly right. Great. Okay. And since you haven't visited with our committee before, um, if you could just give us a, a mini bio, so people will know. Uh, you're asking. Uh, you're asking me for that. Is that correct? Okay. Great. Uh, well, excellent. It's uh, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you, Senator Bray, for inviting me again. And um, and it's uh, as I'm sure it's true for everybody. Kind of odd to be here in this uh, setting. Although I like to see that we have some cows with us in the uh, meeting today. And um, 
And the last time that I was with you was, uh, uh, it was much colder out, but at least we were in person uh, at the State House. So uh, I'm David Cash. I'm currently the Dean of the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at UMass Boston. I've been there for five years. And uh, prior to that, I was in Massachusetts state government for 10 years, two years in, the, in Governor Romney's administration and two, uh, eight years in Governor Patrick's administration. And I held a, a wide range of uh, positions in environment, uh, energy, uh, some of them, were, sometimes my portfolio was extremely broad and covered things like fisheries and forestry and parks. And other times it was much more narrow focusing when I was, uh, uh, I was both commissioner of our Department of Public Utilities and commissioner of our Department of Environmental Protection at different times. Uh, so my uh, portfolio was more limited during those times, um, but always had a focus on uh, the intersection of uh, environmental policy, energy policy, and economic development. Uh, always going with the theory that wise environmental policy um, can strengthen the economy uh, and vice versa. Uh, we never sort of bought into this notion that there's always a trade-off. Certainly there can be, but uh, it, it's not, uh, we don't feel like that is um, a given. Um, and just for the purposes of this, uh, of this hearing, uh, I was on the ground floor of the development and negotiation with many partners here in Vermont with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, that was during the Romney administration and Patrick administrations. And then uh, in the Patrick administration was uh, on the senior team, or the architect of our Global Warming Solutions Act and the numerous different kinds of um, legislative and regulatory efforts that went to support the ultimate goal of greenhouse gas emissions uh, while protecting the environment and growing the economy. So um, I hope that I can be helpful. I totally understand that Vermont is a very different context with different um, uh, legislative, you know, legislative um, foundations and different organizational structure, different economy, et cetera. I totally get that. And um, so I know that uh, not necessarily uh, what worked in Massachusetts will work here, but maybe there are some lessons that, uh, that can be uh, molded. To, to hopefully end up with Vermont having uh, a successful passage of this act and implementation of it. Um, I also do want to note, again, kind of hearkening back to the kind of bizarre time that we're in right now, just the, uh, what I've been hearing, I have friends in Vermont who are very happy with how Vermont has approached the COVID problem. I know that there have been way fewer uh, incidences here than in Massachusetts. We've been struggling quite a bit and, uh, just want to tip hats to the folks who've uh, been protecting uh, your citizens and anyone who's traveling in or out of, uh, of Vermont. So thank you for that. So um, Senator Bray, I know that, that you had asked me in, in one respect to focus on the kind of rules, the development of rules following the, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I'm happy to focus on that. I've had, um, as I've gone through the text of the bill, uh, it has definitely made me think of some of the ways that our Global Warming Solutions Act uh, was successful and what some of the shortcomings are. So, uh, Senator, would, would that be an avenue, a productive avenue for me to go down right now? Uh, sure, sure. And I think just for the committee's sake, you know, there's an interesting question, too, that the, the act um, was in place, I forget, like nine years before it was remanded back to ANR for rulemaking. So a lot of progress was made with uh, Solutions Act sort of uh, in targets in place, but no rules having been done. Yeah. So it, it's a slightly puzzling thing to observe from outside. And yeah. uh, if you can address that in your remarks too, that would be helpful. Sure, and I think we actually had a, a similar kind of problem. Um, there, there was ambiguous rule writing that was uh, required in our Global Warming Solutions Act. At the same time that that act was passed, there were at least two or three other bills that were passed at the same time. The Green Communities Act, which did have a variety of rulemaking responsibilities that were seated in the line agencies, primarily the Department of Environmental Protection and um, the uh, Department of Energy Resources, uh, regulating the renewable energy. And, uh, but in the Global Warming Solutions Act, I, I guess here's one of my take home messages as having kind of lived through the drafting of the legislation and then the attempt to 
craft rules, partly of which were ambiguous, which, which led to a Supreme Judicial Court case in which in fact the state lost uh, because the state was maintaining while I was there that we didn't have to do the kind of strict emissions reduction rules that uh, the Conservation Law Foundation was uh, uh, claiming that we had to do and we ultimately lost that, that case. So clarity of, of rule responsibility in the legislation I think is critically important. But I think one of the things that, that uh, one of the lessons learned is thinking about rule writing in tiers. So I did note that in the, in the bill, the, the Secretariat has the responsibility for rule writing to hit the emissions targets that are laid out, the 2020, 2030, and 2050 um, emissions targets. Now, I was left a little bit confused because of what little I do know about Vermont. I know there's also the line agency, uh, your, your analog to the Department of Environmental Protection, so the Environmental, I think it's Department of Environmental Conservation, as the kind of air regulatory arm. So I was curious of why that line agency didn't have that responsibility. In all of our rule writing, it's the line agencies that have that responsibility. So that's a, that's a question that I had, and I'd be curious what an answer to that is. But the other point is, if you, if you think about these tiers, that, that there should be an overarching rule writing responsibility in the secretariat or in the department that requires the state to hit economy-wide um, greenhouse gas emissions targets. That makes total sense. What I think could be added, strengthened, is that mirror responsibilities or parallel responsibilities in the other line agencies may be equally important. So for example, when I was the commissioner of the Department of Public Utilities, we actually felt hampered because there had not been um, similar kinds of emissions reduction target requirement rule writing for our DPU. So we were not able to institute some of the uh, rule writing that particularly in the second uh, administration, the last four years of the Patrick administration, we were hoping to be able to do. Um, there were uh, cases, and I'll, and I'll explain a couple of these cases where uh, the Department of Environmental Protection not only has air responsibilities, but has waste responsibilities. So the parts of our climate change that were focusing on waste were able to be um, implemented through rule writing within our DEP on the waste side. So for example, we put, we put together a um, organic waste ban and associated uh, regulatory um, structures that went along with that, that could address the greenhouse gas emissions from the waste stream in one particular way, but it was only because our DEP had the uh, rule writing authority to do that. Um, we also did not um, give appropriate authority to our Department of Transportation. We all know that transportation now is the largest um, single sector and uh, without a, a Department of Transportation having a rule writing ability, I think that may lead to difficulties down the road. That is, again, you have the, the overarching statewide greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but if the line agency responsible for the particular emission sources doesn't have that same authority or it doesn't have that same requirement, those are two different things, obviously, um, then there could lead to, to uh, conflict between agencies or actions in one sector that make it very difficult for the whole state to, to reach its um, to reach its goals. So in looking at the, at the Vermont bill, which has a very kind of clear articulation of how the climate planning process happens and the outputs of that climate planning process in terms of suggested legislation, regula regulations, et cetera, I don't think it, it um, requires the agencies that will be responsible to for each of their sectors to do the same kind of rule writing that I think might be necessary. Why don't I stop there with that summary and happy, and happy to take some Q&A on that. Oh, you're, uh, I think you're muted. Uh, one quick question is there is, uh, and you're in a good position having been in and out of government uh, mm -hmm. and in Massachusetts especially. So one, one of the questions that's been discussed in the last uh, couple of days has been the degree to which the, the uh, 
the structure of the council. So is it 22 people all gathered together to write the plan or, or is it the administration because ultimately they're going to have uh, the responsibility of executing that should uh, deliver the plan, but they could work with, you know, 22 uh, advisors or more, you know, in order to have the expertise present. But it would leave the executive branch sort of, quote unquote, owning the plan and then owning the implementation of that plan. It's, it just seems like a clearer um, lines of authority and, and lines of responsibility as opposed to this bigger tent. So and I, we don't want to get stuck on that, but we're, we're trying to sort out how do you have so many unelected people responsible for writing a plan that is actually going to drive legal, uh, legal yeah. ruling. Yeah. I mean, I, again, having, having been in the executive branch um, for 10 years and how we did it in Massachusetts, I would lean toward the, the, the council being driven by the executive agencies and that the, that the stakeholders and other involvement in the council is critically important, critically important to make sure that um, as we move forward, um, actions are taken that uh, don't hurt sectors, that opportunities that particular uh, members of different stakeholder groups have to move to the clean energy future are tapped into, that voices are heard so people aren't left behind. I mean, there are many, many different reasons to have you know, stakeholders at the table and have their perspectives uh, brought to the table. And that, of course, would make it easier once the plan is done that there's you know, sort of baked in buy-in um, from sectors that might be um, that might be impacted. And I will say, you know, we, we always very specifically had, for example, our manufacturing um, association at the table. Now it led to lots of fights, and there was a lot of disagreement. But we never wanted to be in a situation where they'd be able to say, uh, you know, you you didn't have us at the table, you never heard our voice. And there's no question that our policies and regulations were better for it too. So it wasn't just a political thing. It was like we did better rule writing because the manufacturers were at the table and they could say, no, 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 wait a minute. If you're gonna have this requirement, um, this part of our sector will be hurt um, uh, uh, in an unfair kind of way. And we figured out how we could, could solve that. And um, so, so the council, very important um, to get the right information at the table to make sure there aren't unforeseen consequences in particular sectors and to make sure that there's political buy-in. But at the end of the day, I would see the authority of the council in the, in the executive agencies. Okay. Um, and maybe we could just circle back to that sort of um, puzzle or puzzlement for me. Uh, which is, you know, the bill passes in 08, but rules don't get written uh, until after that uh, Supreme Court ruling that remands it to ANR uh, nine years, I think nine years after. Mm -hmm. So what was going on that, um, in a way, you'd say, well, the, the main tool never came out of the toolkit uh, for almost a decade, but Massachusetts made progress. Was it the the mandatory how, how do you explain how you yeah it? yeah it's a great that's a, that's a great question and it's sort of that uh the answer to that question is what made us think um that we would not lose the case and that was the many other regulations that we did whether it was about energy efficiency or renewable energy that was specific to the line agencies um were very effective and you know it was it was it was very, it was hard to argue and you could not argue that had we had the umbrella regulations in, we would have gone faster. Like there was no question in our mind that all of the, you know, in a way, remember I, I described the umbrella and then the line agencies rules below it. We focused on this and they were very, very effective. And, um, you know, in a way the, the umbrella was not, um, was not necessary in those first years. So, um, and, and in fact, we had argued that our, the, the, 
the rules requirements for energy efficiency were enough to hit the greenhouse gas standards that were in our bill. And that's one of the things that we argue. And um, I, again, in retrospect, I would say you want both, however, because what if those rules had not worked? What if the rules, the, the rules done at the line agencies had not been effective? And, um, and in the same way, why you don't want just an above one without the line, because it will be very hard to get the specifics of um, the transportation sector, the building sector, the energy sector, et cetera, the manufacturing sector, it'd be hard to get the specifics right if you're only looking at, a, at an overarching bill. Does that, does that help answer your, the, the, that uh, question, Mark? Sure. I mean, it's uh, my, from reading, my sense too is that you had uh, government aligned. So at the executive branch, plus the legislative branch, both houses, um, mm -hmm. every one those stars were all aligned. So there was a willingness to um, make progress yes. using multiple, multiple tools. It yes. Rely on the rulemaking to drive the state's progress. That's, that's exactly true. And then add in another really important political jurisdiction and that is cities and towns. Our cities and towns were very much engaged as well. So um, that led to a, a, a situation in which there was, li there was little kind of political force saying, oh wait, you're not reaching your goals. Because cities and towns were, they were getting technical support from the state to hit some of their goals. And as you mentioned, the, both houses of uh, uh, both houses in our state legislature and the executive branch were all on the same page and moving in the same direction. Okay, so in Vermont, uh, several years ago, we passed a uh, planning act for energy. Uh, mm -hmm. There, every RP, every regional planning commission has energy targets, and then um, municipalities have been getting technical support to help write the same into their town plans. Um, they gain a greater level of influence deference at the PUC in proceedings if they've done so, things like that. Um, uh, what are you doing? So it's great to hear you reminding us that municipalities are another whole uh, level at which we need cooperation in order to make progress. Can you say a little more about municipalities? Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of interesting for many of us um, when we started the um, drafting of, the, of our climate and clean energy legislation. The Speaker of the House at the time had an idea too of drafting some big piece of energy legislation, but his angle was cities and towns, and that's the Green Community Act. And uh, I will admit that we hadn't been thinking along those lines. We were thinking kind of state level, get a greenhouse gas emission trajectory, figure out how to do air quality, all of these kinds of things. Now, um, the, when we started working with the, the speaker's office on this, it became really clear that there was a kind of genius to the focus on green communities. Um, again, I don't, I, I, I don't know the structure and, and political culture in Vermont, but you know, we are a local control state, so our 351 cities and towns play a really important role um, in decision making on the state level and can act as barriers or wind in our sails for state level efforts. And so when we, um, when we kind of embrace the idea of green communities and then try to figure out, okay, what's the best way to engage communities in this so they have a stake in it and benefits can accrue to them and progress can be made through their actions, we, we designed the Green Communities Program. So it's, it was essentially um, a uh, carrots without stick program. That's not true. It was a carrots with incentives to get the carrots program. So cities and towns had to, and by the way, regulations had, were drafted. So the Department of Energy Resources had to draft regulations and come up with the programs about this. But it essentially was cities and towns had to meet a couple of targets in terms of um, their own facilities, um, their own energy efficiency planning, their own renewable energy planning, fleets planning and things like that. And once they hit these standards, then state funding would be available to them to, um, uh, to do feasibility planning and then ultimately to uh, deploy resources. And uh, so it became an incredibly popular program. Um, and it was something that, um, you know, everyday people could see also because cities and towns were invested in 
advertising what they were doing, were invested in, in gaining interest in, in, in um, the citizens of their cities and towns to move forward with things. And um, so it became a very nice kind of hand in glove um, uh, that complemented the regulatory changes we were, we were doing. So for example, and let me explain that in a, in a moment, if we're requiring the utilities to hit a, a specific amount of energy efficiency targets, let's say, and then you have cities and towns that um, are encouraged and incentivized for them to reduce energy use in their schools and municipal buildings, et cetera, then you can see a perfect marriage of city action and state action because then the cities would go to the utilities and say, utility, we need help doing this to reach our goal. And the utilities are happy to do that because that's how they reach their goals as well. So um, it worked very nicely in a kind of this hand in glove kind of uh, kind of way. And that was all in legislation and then followed up by rule, by rule writing. Oh, you're uh, muted again. The, uh, I'm a dog who's my assistant, so I'm trying to train myself to mute. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, so in terms of uh, one of the things we haven't talked at all about, uh, maybe you could say something, uh, the carrots that go to communities and then uh, these programs uh, in general, yeah. funding is always a bit of a bugaboo. You know, sure. like, well, how are we going to pay for this? So what, yeah. what advice and thoughts do you have to share with us around the funding question? Sure. Um, and I, it probably won't be helpful to say that at the time, you may recall, it was during the last um, Great Recession. And so there was a lot of federal ARA funding that was coming to the states. Uh, we still don't know whether that will actually happen in the next rounds of COVID um, funding. There's a lot of people who are pushing for similar kinds of push for uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency funding going um, in stimulus funding. But let's say we don't have that. The two main sources or the three main sources that we use, I believe are sources that you have available as well. And that is Reggie funds, the utility, uh, so, so rate payer uh, utility support vis-a-vis -vis the energy efficiency programs. And then we also had rate payer support vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, um, uh, renewable energy programs. And those were, those were structured very differently. The renewable energy one um, was a legacy one that is a per, uh, you know, a tiny percentage per, um, dollar on people's bills. Um, so it's sort of like, it, and it roughly comes out to be the same amount, around $25 million per year. The energy efficiency one, however, is a much more dynamic one where the utilities have to reach energy efficiency targets and adjust their rates so that investments can be made uh, to, to reach those targets. That is on the order of like $700 million per year um, within Massachusetts. And all of that money goes back to customers, uh, residential customers, and um, residential or commercial customers. And immediately you might say, well, okay, so that helps people who avail themselves of the program, right? So you have companies who use those, those, that funding, you have homeowners that use that funding, you have rent, uh, renters and landlords who use those programs, and they get the benefits by reducing their, their um, energy bills. Um, the general market, other customers benefit as well because that, um, that serves all of the investments by those who avail themselves of the program serves to lower demand for electricity, which lowers the price for electricity. So of course, if, you don't, if you're not the one who, who gets more uh, weatherization in your house or changes your light bulbs, et cetera, yeah, you're not gonna save as much, there's no question, and your bills you know, you will see some increase in your bill, but you will get some decrease in, in your bill as well because it, it's reducing the whole cost of electricity throughout the region. In fact, Vermont folks and New Hampshire folks and Connecticut folks benefit, and we all benefit from all of the energy efficiency programs throughout New England because we're all in the same ISO market. Uh-oh, your, your dog uh, hit your mute again. Senator McDonald. Um. The, um, our problem is, is not electricity and electricity um, um, changes. We're, 
we've gotten a pretty good grade on that. We're, yeah. we're flunking the um, transportation and the, yeah. um, and the heat. But my question goes back to uh, the rule writing. Um, the bill before us sets in place a commission that would make recommendations that would then be put into a plan and would go into rule. Mm -hmm. In the event that the council does not come up with plans, the fallback position is that the agency um, writes rules based on the state's statutory goals. Mm -hmm. um, you've testified that um, in Massachusetts, those rule, the rules that you promulgated were overturned because the basis of those rules were, I believe, vague or not specific enough. Is that correct? Uh, no, we, we, we didn't draft rules. We didn't draft the umbrella rules. So our inaction uh, was what was at, um, at issue, not that we had done a, a, a wrong job. And it didn't overturn any of the other rules. So all of the things I said, we had done rules on energy efficiency, we had done rules on renewable energy, we had some rules actually on transportation. Um, it didn't negate any of those. It just said you had to have an overarching greenhouse gas reduction rule entire state that you were doing. So that's what it had forced us to do. So, so okay. So I'm I'm concerned that the council will not meet and um, mm -hmm. the administration will then be in the predicament of yeah. having to put forth rules based on yeah. goals that are currently in the statute, which um, doesn't provide a lot of um, many guardrails to what the rules might end up being yeah. and that yeah. the bill was not designed to have that happen, such a thing happen. So any suggestions on how to prevent that? Yeah, so um, again, I'm just kind of look, uh, thinking back to, to the experience in Massachusetts where our council was an advisory council um, and um, it served all of those functions that I mentioned um, earlier. That is, it got expertise at the table, it got perspective at the table, it got political buy-in, but um, it, it wasn't a formal rule writing body. Now, each of the line agencies have their own, as I'm, I, I'm pretty sure Vermont does too, own long administrative procedure um, processes that also require stakeholder engagement, that also require public hearings, public testimony, et cetera, all of those kinds of things. So um, those, didn't, those, those kinds of things didn't have to be written into, um, didn't have to be written into the, the Global Warming Solutions Act or the Green Communities Act because those were already part of. Now, one difference is that there is a statutory body that drives our energy efficiency programs. So um, an, an Energy Efficiency Advisory Council was created that reviews um, the utility three-year plans. Um, and I believe that it does have the ability to accept or reject as a body those plans. And um, so in that way, it does have some kind of um, regulatory authority. So it, if, if you're asking, are there ways to to fix the bill. I mean, maybe if it's explicit that, well, if the council doesn't meet and doesn't do anything, then the executive agencies write the rules. In some ways, that's an incentive for there to be a functioning council and for there to be, for stakeholders to be demanding there as the law is written for there to be a council because that's not a great outcome that the, that the, that the executive agencies without uh, any form of council um, advisory uh, communication writes their own stuff, right? Part of why so many states have gone with these climate related councils is because all of this is incredibly complicated. And it's really important to have both the expertise and political buy-in as, as folks move forward. So um, what it tell me what the give, given the other part of the bill, the last part of the bill, I believe that allows for citizen suits. Why is there a concern that the council won't move forward or that the council won't put forth recommendations 
at, at the end of their term. I, I've been on councils before where the administration um, didn't like where the council was going, so the chair did not hold meetings. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I can, under, I, I can definitely understand that. Um, so thank we, you I, for your answer. Your, thank you. I, I, yeah, no, I, 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 no, that's a, that's a, that's a tough question. And so, so in a world in which, um, and remember, I argued at the beginning that you do want a strong executive running the council. And that of course leads to the concern if you have an executive that's not as interested in the mission that's represented by this bill, well, then you want to have enough, um, belts and suspenders in the bill that support the, um, or, or uh, you know, force the, the executive to do what the what the legislature wanted them to do. You, you you always get that problem, right? And that's why the citizen suits and other other remedies are are part of these kinds of bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was my comment was not directed at this administration. It was past histories that it brought, brings that question up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator McDonald. Yeah, we. I mean, we've talked at various points over the years about, you know, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. Mm -hmm. And we run into that for, uh, on different issues. But so, maybe there is something we can put in the bill that would make them drink. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, perhaps, I don't, I don't yeah. know, but yeah. Well, I think Senator McDonald has been Bring talking that a good point. to Mr. Martland, and I think we'll start putting together some language to help create those belt okay. suspenders. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm eager to hear more questions for um, to Mr. Cash. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm, yes. I'm seeing my my time is quickly running down, and yes. I feel bad about that because I'm totally enjoying this conversation. Maybe I could take one more question and then uh, travel back down to Massachusetts. Oh, it's been helpful. I mean, I, I'm all set. Very helpful. We may yeah. be able to track you down if uh, if we need to. No question. I am more, I mean, this happened really quickly, right? I think Jude reached out to me on uh, Tuesday and it's Thursday. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to do formal, informal phone calls, whatever. Um, it's important work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us. And, My pleasure. Uh, and thanks for your help. For being nimble. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, with that, I'd like to <laughs> return to uh, our patient, former witness, Mr. Coward, and um, put another 15 minutes on your clock. Okay. Uh, what time are we hearing from the treasurer, Mr. Chair? Uh, so that'll be quarter of. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. <laughs> Coward was present at a meeting, at a meeting in uh, May of 05 on the Vermont Yankee uh, uprate, which was a meeting where the minority of a of an advisory council had to call a meeting because the um the chair would not call a meeting to provide advice on that so he's familiar with that sort of situation so thank you uh, so i i'm going to follow up on the um uh, to some degree on what you've just heard about just making a general point about these problems of um accountability and enforceability of an action program. And uh, just to let you know, there's a, you know, a variety of models out in the world. As Mr. Cash said, a, a number of them create climate councils that are quite explicitly only advisory. And the, the main climate council is in that category. Um, the, a, a different example was created in the United Kingdom, the parliament created something called the Committee on Climate Change. And what they wanted to do was to create a very high level uh, expert trusted voice independently that could basically call, uh, remind the parliament of where the nation was on this and to urge the parliament to take action when they weren't doing it. So that's an example of an expert body that uh, also didn't have any authority to enact regulations. Um, and they've, 
been frustrated and I've heard from folks on the Maine Climate Council that, you know, they just don't have any idea if their recommendations are going to uh, make it into regulation or law. So, you know, we just, we do need to remind ourselves that the planners can plan and the watchdogs can bark, but the power to act remains where, just where it was. And so you do have to look for ways to take action. Um, so um, th I've already commented in a positive way about many of the positive elements of this bill. And I want to be clear that I think creating a climate council may well, in fact, be a, an element of a bigger program that would help us. But I'm going to now focus on uh, two problems authority and timing. And now speaking to authority, as the memos from the AG's office and Ledge Council point out, the bill does not inappropriately delegate legislative authority uh, to the Climate Council or to the ANR. The power to create new regulatory programs, to create a carbon tax, new fees, all those things aren't delegated in this bill. The agency retains the authority it already has, and now, in addition, it would have a strong encouragement to use that authority specifically to address climate pollution. But here's the mismatch. Notwithstanding this limitation, the bill requires the agency to demonstrate that its rules would actually achieve the state's climate targets on time. In Section 593A2, the agency is required to develop a record to demonstrate that the rules shall achieve the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. So it, here's the conundrum, and I think Mr. Cash alluded to this as well, it, that if the agency it isn't given new authority, but it is given this mandate to meet these ambitious goals, uh, how's it going to do it? You know, what can it, what can it legally do in the rulemaking process that would meet these ambitious targets? We know that solving these problems, and Jared's slides, you know, pointed out quite clearly, require fairly dramatic reductions in energy used in buildings and energy used for transportation. And we also know that getting that work done is going to require funding. So it, the legislation that is drafted, it seems to me, just creates a mismatch between responsibility and authority for the agency. And um, I mean, I get it that agent, the agency may have authority to do things uh, uh, towards climate uh, goals that it's not now doing. Um, but it seems clear that other agencies, as Mr. Cash pointed out, are going to have to act. And that this agency, the ANR, would need enhanced authority in order to really meet all the, uh, the goals. Mr. Coward, can you say a little more about what would be some examples of the kind of enhancement to their authority they would need in your estimation, well, I, more meaningful progress. Yeah, I, I guess I want to be careful here because I haven't studied the question and, um, you know, of how broad the agency's uh, latent authority is or untapped authority is in the climate realm, and it would take some analysis to do that. So, um, well, so but I don't know. I'm. I wouldn't expect the agency of natural resources to think or for other people to think that it has the authority to mandate that I rip out my oil furnace and replace it with a heat pump. And, and they don't have the authority to raise the fees that would help me to do that. That's an example of what they don't have. Uh, they may have authority over vehicles that they're not exercising. They may have authority over methane emissions that they're not exercising. Right. Right. But um, there's a lot of work to be done here that they, Presently, I think I think it's plain don't have the authority to do. Um, now um, I want to talk about timing. 
there is this problem of delay in acting while we plan. I don't think, given the urgency of the climate crisis and given the fact that the pro kind of programs we're talking about doing take a lot of time to launch and implement that we should wait until 2022 or 2024 to make major progress on targets that we're now setting for 2025. So in, this brings up, you know, it's, I've mentioned to you earlier, I used to teach um, planning, planning law. There's a, there's a big debate in the world of planning over the years over what's the tension between what's sometimes called comprehensive planning on the one end and the extreme other end is called disjointed incrementalism where people just go around and try to solve problems without you know connecting the dots and there is a strategy in the middle which it's often referred to as mixed scanning mixed scanning allows you to take action on things you know you need to do now because you do have a reference to a broader picture and get going on them while you are creating and amending a comprehensive plan. And it seems to me that the climate crisis is a classic example of where you want to engage in mixed scanning. And the good news, as you heard from Mr. Cash and from Jared, um, we've been doing this all along. I mean, thank goodness we didn't wait for a comprehensive climate change plan to launch energy efficiency programs in Vermont or the weatherization program or the renewables uh, programs. You know, we knew that they needed to be done and we acted. So here's a thought for this bill. What if this bill had a section added to it? If, if you want to create the council and you want to create that stakeholder buy-in um, and the public uh, publicness of the process, um, but you don't want to wait too long to have a comprehensive plan. What if you added a section to the bill requiring the council to evaluate and recommend a small number of early action steps that would address, let's just say, up to half of the gap between where we're going under business as usual and where we want to be in 2025. And to get started on programs that we know are going to take decades to fully work, these recommendations could be made within 90 or 100 days, 120 days of the council's creation, have them delivered to the ANR and to the legislature for action within the next year. The, if the ANR already has authority to do those things, they could be required to, to jumpstart that rulemaking as an early action item. If they don't have the authority, the legislature would be, have received a recommendation from the council that we really need to make progress on this, this, and this. The council ought to be able to pretty readily evaluate the leading options and propose a short early action agenda. And I guess I would add and come back to a point you all are conscious of, that urgency is needed to link these actions to economic recovery now. Um, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be moving at a fast clip. You know, we don't wanna wait necessarily for a comprehensive climate plan in order to uh, take action that would be good for economic recovery. Now, do we have an idea what those early action steps would be? I, I would argue that we have a pretty good idea of where we would start, but this would be something for the council to actually deliberate on. But an all fuels efficiency program properly funded, a program to speed up the transition to low emission vehicles, a docket at the PUC to start work on lowering the emissions from natural gas. You know, we've done a great job on electricity. We've done a great job on electric efficiency. 
um, it's time to work on the future of what is now fossil gas heating in this state. So other people might, you know, have two or three other things to put on their list of top threes or top fives. But I'm really just making the point, we have studied these things. We have, we have I, RAP has presented evidence to a legislature for, I suppose, a decade on some of these policies. So have a dozen other uh, well-informed um, experts. We kind of know what we need to do. So if we're going to use the council to kind of jumpstart the process, why not just you know, tell them to come up with an early action plan? Uh, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for that. A, uh, I, I would say, you know, I agree, but I don't know if another state, per, we always you know, like to measure things per capita because that's the only way we sort of win most contests. But uh, per capita, the amount of energy expertise in the state of Vermont, I would say we're incredibly rich in experience and knowledge already. So I, um, while we work on a, a large, uh, as David Cashman was talking about, a sort of an umbrella uh, authority and program, I certainly hope we don't get mesmerized by that and uh, fail to act in a, in a timely manner on the kind of opportunities that are right in front of us and that we can build based on past steps, like the all fuels energy efficiency uh, program you were talking about. Senator McDonald. You are oh. muted, Senator McDowell. And getting jump started is an excellent suggestion. Um, we, we in the legislature uh, toyed a year ago, I think it was a year ago, with a, uh, a modest, some say tepid funding source for uh, thermal heat, and, and it took a lot of heat. Um, but it was so such a modest um, proposal that it died with, as many people said, if you're gonna stick your neck out, you might as well stick your neck out to get something. And um, the wrap, um, I, in my opinion, was sort of sticking with the modest proposal approach and could wrap, or could you or wrap somehow provide us with a realistic, approach um, or such a committee that's being proposed with a realistic approach to jumpstart something that isn't so small that it gets no pushback and big enough to actually start something. Uh, I love your question, I have to say. I, uh, that's terrific. Uh, my argument today would be a, um, a lot more ambitious, let me put it this way. And the reason is that a buildings program in Vermont ought to be a key element of economic recovery. And we, this is the time to create quality jobs, refurbishing buildings and changing out heating systems across the state of Vermont. These are jobs that are gonna be they're not just, it's not just going out and paving a road and then when you get done, that's, that's it. And these, this would be a set of uh, jobs in Vermont that were la will likely last for decades because if you look at the realistic pace of refurbishing buildings in this state, uh, it's going to be a decades long process, which is one reason why we should start as soon as we can. So, I'd make the argument that we want to ramp up that program. You have to start wherever you can start with the workforce and the training and the available funding, but it ought to be on a trajectory to grow and grow over time. And therefore create an incentive for uh, contractors and other enterprises to get in the business and train people to do this work. And um, if we ever needed a time of 
you know, creating sustainable quality jobs that are consistent with climate goals, here, here we are. I mean, so in fact, I'd even go further and say that if we um, are smart about it, given that the cost of money is so low, I would bond for it. Um, you know, we can create a revenue stream, uh, an appropriate revenue stream for a program like that. We can, we could issue bonds to create a uh, even bigger jumpstart. And the revenue returned to the state from that kind of activity would exceed the cost of the bonds. So I, if you want some help with that last sentence, I can um, write some. Uh, a, a document that shows how the revenue to the state would exceed the cost of the bonds would be a valuable document. Well, I, I haven't done the analysis, you know, specifically for Vermont, specifically for 2020, but that um, I'm aware of and have recently reviewed a study that was done by the the largest bank in Germany, it's called the KFW Bank, the Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And they were dealing with the question of what to do with their carbon money from the European carbon trading scheme. And KFW argued that, that um, it should be invested in refurbishing buildings. The Treasury argued that they they couldn't stand to lose the revenue. KFW did the analysis to show, I mean, and this is kind of common sense if you think about it, that if you leverage the money through the bank, private owners end up putting up a significant fraction of the total cost of uh, fixing up buildings. You leverage significant amount of spending. That creates a significant number of jobs and also the sale of building supplies and materials and what have you. And so the combination of the, the income taxes earned for, or paid by the workers, the unemployment compensation that's not paid to the workers, and the sales tax revenue from supplies, equipment, and what have you, um, all added up in most scenarios returning four euros to the treasury for every euro that the treasury thought it was giving up. And I can provide that study to you. Mr. But Chair, the, this is a great conversation. I'm just concerned that we have a 12 o'clock uh, stop and we have the treasurer waiting and you're muted, just so you know. <laughs> As usual, it's very quiet. Um, so thank you for that. and. Um, uh, Rick, if you could send that study over to us, that would be helpful. And it's actually appropriate. I want to uh, thank you for your uh, helpful testimony. Always helpful. And if you could send the study, that will be helpful to us. I know that it's been a frustration to the committee that when we look at our weatherization program, it's funded at about one tenth or one eleventh the level of revenue that the electrical efficiency charge was funded right. at. So no wonder it's been hamstrung on some level. And um, and since you brought up bonds and funding, and um, this is a perfect moment to be segueing to our patient treasurer, Treasurer Pierce. Um, good morning and thanks for uh, being on the meeting with us. So. There's a handoff, a bond related question, and um, you might have other remarks too about Global Warming Solution Act. We're happy to hear your thoughts. Okay. Can, can you hear me? We'll start with that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good news. I'm learning the technology. So I'd like to address the climate change issues first um, and then uh, take on the bonding if we have questions. I know you got a, a quick, um, a stop there, and I don't know if it's a hard stop, but uh, so I'm going to go through my uh, uh, my thoughts on the climate uh, uh, change issue and the uh, Global Solutions um, Act here. So I would uh, start with that, um, you know, the climate change is obviously a serious threat to our way of life and the future well-being of our citizens. And from my perspective and what I pay attention to in particular is the uh, its impact on our financial bottom line. Uh, you know, these are not threats that are down the road. Uh, they are here with us today. 
and they do require a collaborative effort from all parties, and that includes local, state, and federal governments in concert with the private sector. Uh, that's something we're pretty good at in Vermont, uh, that collaboration uh, versus some other states. Uh, and what happens in D.C., I should add. Uh, Vermont has been a model in a number of businesses, solar, wind, uh, clean water technologies, uh, and we have articulated very ambitious goals to address climate change in a clear energy future. But we have not met those goals and are not presently able to meet them. Uh, Vermont has not done nearly enough to combat climate change or reduce our greenhouse emissions. It's been said already, but uh, we've uh, failed to curb our total emissions in the transportation and heating sectors and are woefully behind where, we sh uh, where it should be. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, what I would say too is a report that was issued uh, um, on, on, this, on the state, it said the bulk of uh, Vermont's total emissions come from transportation and the heating sectors and we've already missed our goals there and is likely to miss future goals as emissions have continued to rise, making it more difficult to, heat that, uh, to meet that target. Um, there was a 2018 uh, report from uh, uh, Agency of Natural Resources uh, where they clearly identified uh, that we have failed to meet our goals. And it goes on to say Vermont greenhouse gas emissions remain at levels well above its reduction goals established by statute in the Comprehensive Energy Plan. Each successive year, of increasing emissions makes achieving those goals more difficult. And that gets to the question and, and, and what's been said by uh, previous speakers is that uh, putting this off is not a good thing. Uh, we need to deal with it now. You know, about um, three years ago, uh, three years ago, January, um, I wrote a um, paper and an op-ed on, uh, on, on clean water uh, with the help of a number of different agencies. And I did an op-ed uh, and it was entitled The Financial Case to Protect Vermont's Water. And uh, as a treasurer, I was um, uh, asked to do some work on the funding and financial recommendations. Uh, but with that study and in that op-ed, I said, we have a choice. We can act or we can defer action. And uh, the bottom line is that we cannot continue to defer action. Simply put, there is no other choice without jeopardizing the, house, uh, the, the health of our uh, citizens, our economy, our natural resources, our way of life, and as I said, um, our, the financial future of Vermont. Uh, we're in a similar position now. Uh, there's an enormous task ahead of us, and if we delay, um, it's at our peril and the, and the peril of our citizens. Um, and every day we delay, we have more risk and more costs associated with it. And I wanna point out that there is a cost associated with it. So let's talk about uh, the risk in climate change. Um, and some of the uh, some of the issues, and and you folks have looked at many of them, but uh, uh, what's caught my attention uh, uh, is that farms clearly are dealing with climate change, with temperature swings, rain uh, increasing, uh, and intensity as as well, more floods and changing and increasing numbers of pests. Um, our sugar season has already been impacted. Uh, more funds are needed for infrastructure, uh, and uh, it's obviously uh, impacted our snow snowfall. When I wrote the uh, Clean Water Report, I mentioned that tourism was about a $2.5 billion industry in this state. My, I haven't looked at recent numbers over the last three years, but I would assume that they're over $3 billion now. And the cost of mitigating um, um, weighs heavily uh, on the, the detrimental impact of not doing it uh, in terms of that tourism industry uh, and, and, and other issues. Uh, including, uh, as, as we just mentioned, our, our building uh, trades and being able to put people into full employment. Uh, we have done many things, and I commend folks in both the Scott administration and the Shumlin administration for, uh, for those efforts. Uh, we do have a hazard mitigation plan, the state uh, that I believe was issued in 2018, and it talked about the various um, uh, resources that uh, are av available uh, the Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund, uh, Vermont's um, stream alternatives uh, in the general permitting, our collaborative work on flood resilience. Uh, it reviews uh, hazards uh, such as invasive species, extreme heat, drought, infectious disease, and more. Um, but while those efforts are there and that report mentions it, you know, the, on page 143 of that report, it says that our, uh, our efforts and priorities are, quote, still, still evolving. 
and it talks about we intend to create. Uh, you know, it, th- that whole concept of it's still evolving is a problem for me because that's what we keep saying. We're not moving off the dime and getting into action. Um, so for me, uh, the solution is a process. Uh, first, developing uh, uh, climate change goals and making requirements to link those to action. Uh, developing an action plan through strategies and policies, implementing that plan, and monitoring that plan, including progress on regulation and policy uh, that requires action and measures uh, the effects. This act does that. It also protects vulnerable communities and populations. It encourages smart growth, and it supports new farm farming practices. So um, I know we're running short of time, but I'd like to point out the impact on our ratings as well, and not so much the ratings, but what they're saying about it and why they're interested in it. Um, there are a number of documents that the uh, rating agencies have put out. Uh, Moody's did something in 2017 called Evaluating the Impact of Climate Change on State and Local Issuers. And what they pointed out in that, that, uh, that they're interested in a couple of things. What are the mitigation strategies that states are using? Uh, what are the cash flows associated? And what are the emergency plans? After Irene, we had similar questions. We, w- we were asked by a rating agency, uh, you know, a couple of days after um, Irene hit, you know, how much does it cost? How are you going to pay for it? And can, uh, and can you pay uh, for it and still do your debt service? One of the concerns that they would have. And uh, at that point, I said, well, it's a little early on cost, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously we're going to pay our debt service. But they also mentioned in the, that 2017 report uh, similar issues, the impact on the property tax. Uh, when you took a look at water, for instance, and the impact it had on property tax, uh, where, for instance, in the uh, town of Georgia, uh, state sales tax, tourism, um, and uh, you know, for, and also on the other side, as it's been mentioned, you know, the ability to use this uh, for local investment. I appreciated Jared's comments on that, and our previous speaker on, on you know, the economic generation that we can have. You know, in on July of uh, in July of 19. Um, Moody's, one of the rating agencies, acquired a majority share in a company called 24-7. And this company uses outputs on climate change models to assess the physical risks associated with climate change and the process and effects that that are going on in the the public sector, including state and local governments, as well as the private sector. Now, why would Moody's do this? And, you know, because that's a little outside of their, uh, their, their, their main focus. And the, is, the reason is that they want to provide meaningful data on the governments. Uh, they want the finance committee investors who buy our bonds, who know that, uh, what the risks are, and how are we doing in terms of managing that. And I'd like to point that out. Investors are interested in what we're doing on climate risk. And that doesn't mean just folks that buy our bonds, but it's folks that want to move here and establish their businesses here. And they are concerned uh, about those issues because, again, uh, this is not uh, uh, something in Moody's bailiwick. This is a concern that they have. And I will tell you that our last meeting with them, one of the questions was on climate change. Uh, Climate change is a material risk in their their ratings, and it is a material risk in terms of uh, companies that are assessing whether they want to come to Vermont. You know, um, again, uh, coming back to those those reports, I'd like to, uh, and I will send you the, uh, the, those reports um, in, in the next couple of days. Uh, they talk about, yes. Chair, yes. yes, please. Um, you're muted, first of all, Mr. Chair, just so you know. Yes. Um, my, uh, the uh, question that I have is, you mentioned that investors are looking for, uh, is it, is it an, an the state's investment in renewable energy? Uh, yes, they're interested in what we're doing on, on renewable energy, but and, and just as important in terms of those climate shocks, um, what are we doing in terms of risk mitigation strategies? If you're going to move here, you want to know whether you're going to be susceptible to more flooding. If you're looking to do some type of agricultural uh, yes. uh, uh, in innovation technologies, you want to know whether or not you're going to be able to 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 meet those uh, in in our state. Uh, and I'm going to read right from the from the Moody's report. Again, uh, it says, in addition to the loss of life and threats to public safety and health, these events present multiple challenges in the form of cro- um, compromised crop yields, economic disruption, damage to physical in- infrastructure, increased energy demand recovery and restoration costs, 
and the cost of adaptive strategies for prevention or impact mitigation. And they point out that those costs um, are, are better, you know, it's pay me now or pay me a lot more later um, is the bottom line for me. And the bottom line is, again, what they, what they mentioned in the report is, um, is lower revenue, increased expense, impaired assets, higher liabilities, and increased debt, among other things. So they're, they're interested, the investors that are buying our bonds are interested, and people that want to come to Vermont are interested um, in how we're dealing with this. And it does impact our economy is, is, is my bottom line on that. And uh, again, Moody's would not be buying into a, a company that's, uh, that's doing ri uh, climate risk assessment if they weren't concerned about this issue. Uh, you know, why um, I would like to point out as well uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know why why we need to do this and uh, and and again it's about from my end our economy and how we're managing that economy. So I'm going to cut this a little short, but I'm going to go back to something I said uh, early on. And again, uh, what what I said was that uh, we have a choice, you know, to act or not to act. Um, and uh, the, the the consequences of not acting are impacts on our economy, our revenue base our property taxes, um, increased costs, and, uh, and impairment of our tourism dollars. Um, that's not a good thing. On the other side, acting um, is something that will in increase local investment, increase jobs, um, and be uh, something that investors and uh, uh, others that are interested in, in settling in Vermont and, and making their home in Vermont or making their business in Vermont are interested in. So for me, the question again is, do we act? or do we um, do delay? And the bottom line for me, time to act, um, and we must act now. This bill brings us uh, a long way toward, uh, toward that uh, objective. So I support the bill, and I urge you to pass it. Thank you. Great. Um, and, uh, thanks for hanging in there, and committee, thanks for staying a little over so that we could uh, finish. I think it, when we get the report uh, that Mr. Coward's sending on to us, I'd love to be able to loop back to the uh, treasurer again and, and discuss funding further. Um, when there's a positive rate of return on additional debt, um, I know that we're always maxed out on our bonds, but I'm just wondering if there are, uh, we can have a discussion about other, uh, maybe novel instruments or, uh, you know, there was an awful lot of things like credit default swaps, all sorts of instruments were got in created to help facilitate financial work in the past. Hopefully, some of those didn't work out very well. I'm wondering if mm -hmm. there's some opportunity uh, to look at novel, or maybe I should say not traditional bonding, but if yep. we know there's that positive rate of return, is there a way, a role for the state to play in facilitating that? Not that we own the debt, but that we facilitate the debt. Something like that. Mr. Chair, I need to leave. Um, if, you, if you have a quorum, I have a, an interview. Okay. So, well, Would you like me to address that now or, or later, sir? I apologize for asking a big question right at the end. So we'll have to come back to that, but um, thank you everyone for joining us. I can address it now if you'd like. It's up to I'll, you. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll schedule one more time and I'll give you a call as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. And again, uh, you know, the only real choice in my, in my assessment uh, from a financial side is action now. So thank you very much for the time uh, and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Thank you, Commissioner Duggan.